Welcome to this OpenMP SE21 Booth talk. Today I'm going to talk about NUMA in OpenMP. And the talk has been split into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to go into an explanation of what NUMA is, to explain the concept, things to watch out for, etc. In the second part, I will zoom in on the specifics uh, regarding OpenMP and in what way OpenMP can support to optimize for NUMA in your application. My name is Luis van der Pas, and my background is in mathematics and physics. Previously, I worked at several other companies and uh, institutes, including the University of Utrecht, Convex Computer, SDI, and Sun Microsystems. Currently, I work in the Oracle Linux Engineering Organization, and I've been involved with OpenMP since the introduction. I still remember that I was at SDI when it came out, and I thought, this is cool. And uh, even as of today, I still think OpenMP is a very cool parallel programming model. I'm passionate about application performance issues in general, but in particular when it comes to OpenMP. Whenever I get an OpenMP performance challenge, I'd like to solve it and, um, and crack it and uh, find out what's going on and make it go faster. So what is NUMA? NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. And that pretty, pretty well describes what it is. It means that the time it takes to fetch data from memory is not a constant. This time depends on where the data physically resides in memory. And for some of you, that may be a new concept because um, for a long time, systems would have what we call a flat memory. The memory access time from memory was always the same, no matter where your data was. On a NUMA system, it's no longer that simple. So let's look at a typical NUMA system. What I'm showing here is, um, is a node. A node is, is like a mini, mini computer system. It, it has a bunch of cores, it has a set of caches, including the uh, last level cache, which is uh, usually called LLC, that connects to the, the memory on that node. So this is, is like a computer. You can run your program on it. But in this case, it's part of a bigger thing. So there's a connection to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is connected through a special interconnect. So this is not like your regular ethernet connection or something like that. This is a special dedicated interconnect that connects multiple nodes together. In, in this case, uh, we see four, four nodes. So from this picture, it's hopefully clear that a NUMA system is a distributed system. Uh, memory is scattered over the system. The cores and the caches are scattered over the system. But it has a very special characteristic. Before I go into that, the question is, why would you want to build a system like this? Well, the first reason is cost. Uh, it's, it's relatively cheaper to, to build a larger system consisting of smaller nodes and glue them together uh, in a way that I'm showing here. But for performance, it, there's a huge advantage. The advantage is the bandwidth. As you add nodes, you add bandwidth to memory. And that's a big thing for many applications. Uh, you also add cache space, you add cores, but in particular, you get much more scalable bandwidth as you grow the system and add nodes. That interconnect is called cache coherent. Um, cache coherent interconnect, that's a world in itself that will be a special talk to just talk about that. Here, I'm going to keep it very simple. And what the bottom line is of a cache coherent interconnect is that it provides what we call a single system image. To you, this appears like, like a system with a bunch of memory and a bunch of cores and caches. You don't see the underlying topology of the system. You don't see how complicated it is. When you use a tool like TOP, it will just report to you how many cores you have, how much memory there is, etc. Uh, there are special commands to actually query the system, but the, the general uh, Linux commands will hide this com complex architecture for you. And the reason is, is because of the cache coherent interconnect. The cache coherent interconnect does a lot of magic. Uh, it will get you your variables when you need it. So um, it transforms this system to the user in what we call a single system image. Another concept that I need to talk about is, um, is hardware threads. Um, that'll come back in the uh, second part when I zoom in on OpenMP. Uh, so what is it? In addition to the cores in a node, those cores may have a, additional what we call hardware threads, and they are meant to accelerate multi-threaded applications. Now, have, 
Cord not necessarily needs to have these hardware threads. It, that's uh, one of the design uh, parameters to support additional hardware threads, but they're fairly common. They're also known as um, hyperthreads, uh, strands. And again, what it means is that the core has ad additional power to execute multi-threaded applications or, or multiple processes for that matter. This is the way a developer should look at a, at a NUMA system in a way. What you have is you have um, a way to execute your threads, but those uh, threads could be scattered over the system, and they probably are. Uh, the same is true for your data. Your data is probably scattered over the system, and it's all connected together through some magic. And the magic will make sure that if you need some variable, wherever you are, you will get it. It doesn't matter in which memory it is. The hardware will take care of it. But there's a little thing about performance. And I now want to talk about local versus remote access types. And that also explains the name, non-uniform memory access. Let's say your, your thread is executing in the top left corner somewhere in one of those cores, and it needs some data. In the good case, it will get it from the local memory. We call that local access, and that's the fastest you can get at the memory level. You can't get any better. That's your, that's your goal, in a way. In that way, you get the best uh, performance out of your memory system. But it could also happen that your data is further away. And we call that remote access. Remote depends on the topology of the system. In this case, there's one hop. There could be multiple hops. It could get very, uh, fairly complicated. In any case, remote access or remote access is always slower than a local access. How much depends on the architecture, depends on the state um, the cache line is in and other things. But um, the rule of thumb is local access is good. Remote access is bad, and you should try to avoid it wherever you can. That brings me to why NUMA tuning matters. I sometimes get asked, like, why, why do you care so much? Why, why, should, why should I care about the underlying architecture? Well, I hope this slide, once and for all, settles that discussion. What I'm showing here, the performance in, um, in gigaflops of a matrix vector multiplication written in C, it's a highly parallel uh, algorithm. You can compute all the dot products in parallel. So it's a very parallel algorithm. You almost can't get it any better than that. And what I'm showing is the performance for two versions of that algorithm. One didn't take new tuning into account, and that's the green line. And as you can see, even all the way up to 64 threads, there's, there's, no, there's no, no scalability. There's hardly any performance gain at all. It's very, very poor performance. On the other hand, with a NUMA tuning um, applied to this algorithm, I got pretty good performance. And ultimately, on 64 threads, the NUMA tuned version is a factor of 22 faster. So that's significant, and I hope that's compelling enough for you to be interested in NUMA and tuning for NUMA. I now want to talk a little bit more about data, because hopefully by now it's clear that a NUMA architecture is all about where's my data. And you need to know that in a NUMA system, every memory page has a home node, as it's called. That's where the data lives. You may get a cache line that's moving away from the home node and in the cache elsewhere. But at, at the end of the day, that home node has to be kept up to date with any changes that you make. So where's the home node? That's controlled through what is called the placement policy. There are different placement policies. And the placement policy controls where the home node is of that page in memory. And a commonly used policy is called first touch. So what is that? With the first touch placement policy, the data page is in the, allocated in the memory that is closest to the thread accessing this page for the first time. So what does that mean? You have, you have sort of your, your data. You haven't done anything with it. The moment you start using that data, that's when the home node is, is uh, decided. And it's decided by giving it to the thread that uses that data for the first time. So that's what first touch does. The name is fairly well chosen. It pretty much reflects what's happening. And for good reasons, this is the default policy on Linux and other OSs. I'm not sure whether all OSs have this as the default, but certainly it's quite common. And the reason is that this is the right thing to do for sequential application. If you're running single-threaded, what you want, you want to have your data as close as possible 
to the to wherever you're executing and that's exactly what first touch does now in the definition above it talks about memory closest to the thread because it may happen that uh, your sort of your local memory is full and in that way in that case you'll you'll get um, a nearby memory the operating system will try to find you a memory as close as possible to where you are certainly um, again first touch is really good for a sequential application but when you look at a parallel application, that's not so obvious. For example, um, it can easily happen that all your data ends up on a single node, in the memory of a single node. Well, what if other threads need that data too? They'll have to go and fetch it, that will take longer. So that's when performance, um, performance becomes an issue, memory performance becomes an issue. So a first step towards tuning for memory is to avoid that all data is in the memory of a single node because usually that's not a desirable situation. It happens in case your data initialization is sequential. So um, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is by virtue of first touch, because in that case, a single thread touches the data and defines the home node. Luckily, very often there are very easy solutions to get around this. And here's a simple example, but it's actually quite typical of the kind of things you need to do when you want to control, better control where your data ends up. I have a loop here and I'm initializing a vector a to zero, very straightforward. If I wouldn't do anything, one thread would execute this loop and that would define the home node of that vector a. What if I don't want to do that? Well, you simply parallelize it in this case with the parallel four and with this, uh, the static schedule, as you, as you probably know, in OpenMP, that means the loop will be chopped up in pieces. Each thread will execute a, a piece of the iteration space. And that means each thread will have a slice of A in its memory. So you automatically distribute the data. And this is how you leverage first touch and take into your advantage. First touch will now make sure that every thread has a, has a portion of A, if that's of course what you want. Be aware that all memory allocations are on the level of the virtual memory page, not individual elements of cache lines. It, it's on a larger granularity. A virtual memory page is typically four kilobyte, eight kilobyte, maybe 64. So um, that's the unit of, um, of allocation. Another thing I want to talk about is thread affinity. Thread affinity provides a way for you to specify where threads should execute. And you often use that to get your thread close to the data. You sort of, uh, in a symbolic way, you know where your data should be and you want to get your, your threads close to it to minimize the memory access time. On Linux, there are tools like NUMA control that, that you can, can use for this, but it's, it's very high level. You probably, probably need to go a level lower and that's where OpenMP comes in because as I'll show in the second part of this uh, presentation, OpenMP provides very nice affinity controls to completely tell the system what you really want to do. But be aware, NUMA control uh, can be used. It's, it's often a good way to do some sanity check. If you, um, if you want to just see if, if this is an issue at all, you can play a bit with NUMA control, but eventually you'll probably want to go uh, more fine-grained control through OpenMP. I want to finish with um, some other, other things to watch out for. In case you read data from a file, for example, that's typically done by a single thread. Uh, that means, as you should know by now, that thread will own all the data. The home node has, has been defined. And as you go through to execute your program, the home node will still stay the same. How to avoid it? Well, you can do a redundant parallel initialization of your data. Assume, let's say you're, you're reading a vector from a file. Well, if you use the trick that I've just shown, that vector, and you do that before you do the I.O., of course, that vector will have its placement defined already. So when you read in the data, that'll be distributed across the, the nodes. So that's a very easy way. Conceptually, it's easy. It may not always be easy to implement it in the application, but that's the idea. And it's surprisingly powerful. Another thing that tends to take people by surprise is malloc. malloc does not really allocate data. What it does, you, you request the, the operating system, give me this chunk of memory, and it will tell you it's available or not. And if it's available, nothing, nothing is done yet. All the system does is rever reserve that block of, of uh, memory for you. 
but no allocation has been done. So what will happen then when you start using the data, that's, that's when, by virtue of first touch, that's when the home node is going to be defined. So when you malloc data, again, nothing will happen until, until you start using that data that you've just allocated, like typically initialize it. So um, make sure that the thread that needs that block of data actually initializes it to make sure it, um, the memory access time is, is, is lowest. Last, uh, another one to watch out for is C-alloc. C alloc will, will initialize the uh, memory block to zero for you, which is convenient, but it also means that at that point after the C alloc call, the home node has been defined and that may or may not be a desirable situation. So to wrap it up, uh, this short overview of NUMA, I hope it has uh, helped you to understand better what NUMA is about, the kind of things to watch out for. I also introduced some, uh, some of the key concepts um, like a first touch, Definition, the home node, the whole concept of uh, memory allocation, where things go, the fact that you have the transparent memory access, but, but you have the difference between local and remote accesses. I hope that's all a little, little clearer now, and some of that will come back in the second uh, part of the talk, where I'm going to show you how you can use OpenMP to leverage a NUMA architecture. Remember, the, the strength of the NUMA architecture is the scalability. You have a lot of bandwidth, so if you can exploit that, you can get very good performance. You also have additional cache space scattered over the system. If you can take advantage of that, you can get really good performance out of a NUMA architecture. For now, thank you. As always, stay tuned. And in case uh, somebody tells you OpenMP does not scale, just correct them and say bad OpenMP does not scale. Before I go, the two websites that I uh, want to point out. First of all, there's OpenMP.org. OpenMP.org is your place to go for anything about OpenMP. I would bookmark that site and visit it quite often. There's a lot of, uh, lot of things happening around OpenMP. On this website, you will find the specifications, not only the new ones, but also the older ones. There's a forum where you can ask your questions and um, you get a qualified answer. There are other users, but also language committee members that will help out with answering the questions. So a really good place for your OpenMP questions. There are reference guides, events are announced, uh, there are links to all sorts of videos, um, other material like books and articles. So it's really a good place to, um, to visit quite often, openmp.org. Specific to this event, uh, SE21, there's a website where we will collect all the videos and the PDFs of the slides. So if you want to look at some talks, uh, you want to watch them and download the PDF, just go to this website and you'll find all of them nicely grouped together. For now, enjoy. And again, thank you for your time.